Okay, I think we have a good number of people in, so why don't we give everything a start today? Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we are doing a presentation today. STEM CX is the sponsor and the co-sponsor today is uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Epsilon Omega Chapter. So we're gonna start off with uh, Dr. Tanya Ringel, the president of the chapter. So let her say a word of hello and introduction. Hello everyone and good afternoon. And I'm very happy to be here to represent um, Alpha Kappa Alpha and it's especially Epsilon Omega Chapter in joining STEM CX. With Epsilon Omega Chapter and Alpha Kappa Alpha in general, we support education, especially STEM. We have an initiative that supports historically backed colleges and universities. Recently, um, September 21st, we just raised another $1 million in a day for the third year in a row. And that helps all of you students into, you know, getting scholarships to become those engineers and aerospace engineers, uh, whatever you want to be. We support education. We're happy to be here with STEM CX. And thank you um, to Sandy for for bringing us all together. Because I'm looking forward to everything that we're going to be learning. So I'm excited. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. So as uh, Dr. T uh, Ringo just mentioned, I am S Sandy Adams and we are from STEM CX. It's an organization that is dedicated to exposing children uh, in middle school and high school to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we are thrilled today to have Sydney Hamilton, aerospace engineer from Boeing, along with the Hampton University Aviation Department. So just a little um, house, housekeeping, I'd like to tell you first, not only is STEM CX presenting today, but we're presenting as part of the Maryland STEM Festival. So I'm gonna put on my second hat, it's the Maryland STEM Festival. So for those of you who have not already gone to the festival site and seen all the wonderful free activities that are out there, the festival will be running online virtually this year until November 1st. So please take advantage. We had a wonderful activity yesterday. Take advantage of all the free stuff out there. It's a great learning experience for all of you. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do here is share with you a video. So I'm gonna share that with you. And then right after that, we're going to have Sydney Hamilton begin discussing, telling us a little bit about herself and then telling us a little about our topic. Thank you. 
Sydney, take it away. Awesome, thank you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Sydney Hamilton and I'm an aerospace engineer at the Boeing Company. Um, I have always been interested in the sky, just fascinated with just looking up and wondering what else is out there. Uh, when I was a little kid, I would stand outside with like the whole get up, the blanket tied around your neck and just try to fly. My parents would, tell me, oh, Sydney, why don't you get a jet pack or an airplane or, you know, there's other ways you can fly. I wasn't trying to hear it. I was like, I, Sydney Hamilton, want to fly. So it makes sense that I'm an aerospace engineer now because I'm flying just a little bit differently than I initially imagined. I started my schooling at Spelman College whoop, whoop, and um, got my math degree from there and then went to University of Michigan through the dual degree program and got my aerospace engineering degree. Actually, the first job I had out of college was Boeing and that's where I still am seven years later. Um, I've had a very fruitful and cool career there. So I started off on aircraft design on, I won't bore you with a bunch of numbers, but they're the really, really big planes. 767 and 777. You'll hear me say that a lot. Um, from there, I learned how to design specifically for aircrafts. What questions do you need to ask? So that factory that you just saw in the video, I've been in that factory. They are cranking those aircrafts out every couple of weeks. When I came in, something drastically looked different every single day. Wings are all of a sudden magically attached after I've come in in the morning and left in the afternoon. Um, you see the wheels being attached and they have this whole full assembly and factory manufacturing line down to a T so they can just continue moving quickly, quickly. From there, I went to airplane repairs, which means all those times you had airplane delays or something happened to the plane and it needed to be fixed at two o'clock in the morning, likely they were giving myself or one of my teammates a call and you travel to wherever the airplane is to fix it, to make sure that it's up and running. Uh, after that, I wanted to see new technology. So I moved to the space side of aerospace and work, and now I work on air satellite reflectors and 3D printing parts for spacecrafts. So seeing that innovation and being able to now apply that back to the airplane side has been extremely cool and lots of fun. So let's talk about how we actually design the aircraft. Uh, if you've heard of design thinking, feel free to drop in. Yes, I've heard of design thinking. I know the steps, I've, or I've never heard of this before. What is this? Because that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So feel free to jump in the chat box. So what design thinking is, it's a solution-based approach to things. It's how, rather than just saying we have a problem it's dissecting the problem and figuring out what is the human aspect of it what is what all do i actually need to think about and so there are five main steps that we'll walk through which would be empathize define empathize define ideate aka brainstorm prototype and test so starting with empathize okay what, it, what are we doing? Why are we here? What are the people's needs? So I'm gonna ask a question and we answer it with the five whys. The five whys are basically diving deep as to what the root cause is. So let's say I'm late to class. Okay, well, why was I late to class? Uh, I went to bed late. Why did I go to bed late? Uh, I was watching that movie that came on in the middle of the night and I just went ahead and watched it all the way through. So the real problem was that I was watching this movie so late at night. So when I'm coming up with a solution, I'm not starting from just the, oh no, I can't be late anymore. And you start changing the wrong things, which is sometimes what happens when we have problems. You 
identify not the root cause of the problem, but maybe some some other factors that play into it. So empathize with everyone, doing your research, understanding why people are doing something. So airplanes, we're thinking staying connected, traveling, business, families, friends, vacation, fun. So we're traveling for a lot of different reasons. So now when we go to step two, which is define, we can really define what, what we're looking for when designing an aircraft. People want to go somewhere safely. Safe, safety is number one. You want to get there quickly, comfortably, and ideally for pretty cheap. Because I can imagine if I can do all those other things, but you have to pay $100,000 for a plane ticket seat, you're probably not going to get on that airplane. You'll probably figure out another way to get there. So keeping all those factors in mind when defining the problem. So our, the thing that airplanes are solving is getting people safely, quickly, comfortably, and inexpensively from one place to another. So now that we've defined our problem, you can talk about the observations, the, thing, the things that you, you've seen or that you want to do better. Oh, I've actually been on an airplane before and the seat belts didn't work that well. So do we wanna incorporate that in our next iteration of this plane? So now we're brainstorming, we're ideating. You're working together as a team to say, okay, let's think outside of the box. Um, if you've ever seen, been on an airplane and seen the tips of the wings curve up like this, let me know. <laughs> I can actually explain why we do that. They didn't, they haven't always done that. And that's because we were looking for more fuel effective ways to fly. The longer the wingspan, which really what that means is the longer the wing, the more surface area you have across the top, the more fuel effective your aircraft will be. And by just adding those little curves, you're in, improving your fuel efficiency by 10, 20%. So it's actually to make the wings longer. A project that I've worked on was the 777X, more numbers, and it is gonna be the very first commercial folding wing tip that's mechanical. So you will actually be on the aircraft and you will see it lift up and lie flat. The main reason we did that was to increase the wingspan or the length of the wing so that we can have better fuel efficiency. And you say, well, why didn't, why make it mechanically bend up? It was actually too long to fit in all of the hangars or airplane garages. And we know that people don't wanna rebuild all of their uh, storage for their aircrafts. So we made it move. And so that's some of the things that you ideate. Think outside of the box. What do we usually do? And how do we do something different? Um, yes, we can definitely get you the link to the aircraft video too. And um, I can send some links later that just talk about the 777X as well. So you can actually send. We just recently had first flight, which is really cool, which brings me kind of to my next one of prototyping. Before we could do that, I said I worked in 3D printing. Something that's really great is to be able to create a smaller scale version of what you're trying to do and make sure it fits together. So we do a lot of rapid printing, additive manufacturing. All that means is we're 3D printing smaller parts and doing a kind of jigsaw puzzle to see, does this all fit together? Does this work? And testing that before it's actually going into flight. So we're at step four, prototyping. How can we scale this down? Sometimes drawing it out, that can be considered your prototype because you're understanding how things fit together, how things are being built, and is this the best way to do it? What's been done before? Adding in that research that you did from the beginning. Lastly, you test out your solution. So we have first flight of every aircraft. And for the 777X, there were four, the first four that were ever built are strictly for testing only. What are its limits? What can it do? If a, someone messes up, how, how much correction do we actually have? So that when we are training our pilots, we can say, don't go above this. No matter what, this is, this is your threshold or this is your, your maximum limit of 
how quickly you can land without tearing the tires, which is actually quite common. It, people land very quickly and those tires get hot. Nothing overly dangerous. It's just very expensive to replace airplane tires. And so you test out those solutions, you see what's happening, um, and then you can adjust accordingly. And you kind of go back through the stages of, all right, now that we see that we want to do this different, let's empathize, let's do the research on our people. Okay, let's define what the actual problem is. Let's ask our whys. Let's ideate, brainstorm, and fix whatever that issue is. Prototype, build it all together quickly because traditional manufacturing takes much longer than just printing it off in a 3D printer. And then test it out until we have exactly what we're looking for. So that's how we kind of think about building an aircraft. This is how you think about lots of other issues or um, how you solve complex problems to make sure that you're addressing everything. So a question asked, how long does it take to build an airplane? That's a really great question. From start to finish, from scratch, um, if you're going to fly a commercial aircraft, it could take you somewhere between seven to 10 years because you are going through so many iterative processes. If you are redesigning an airplane that already exists, it's probably gonna be closer to three to five years. So when you're planning, you are looking so far out and saying, my test date is five years from now. How do we get all of this done? Because you have to figure out how to do the assembly line of the manufacturing. Where is this gonna go in our factory? Because our factory is just, it's huge. Um, so the cost to build an airplane, well, I know exactly how much we sell them for. It, I wanna say it's the triple seven. So these are the bigger ones. Again, um, it costs $333 million to buy a commercial aircraft. So I imagine, <laughs> exactly, it's a lot of money. It's that money coming out the door. So each one of those going out the door, it's a lot of money. Um, I would say that there's probably a good margin on that for profit. So it probably costs around 250 million, something like that. But you're talking about technology, interior. Uh, I mean, you're, you're flying people safely and that is a lot of cost and a lot of time. And when I say hundreds of thousands of people are touching each one of these aircrafts, whether you're a designer, whether you're an inspector, whether you're in the finance team, there's so many different elements to be uh, that need to happen to build this aircraft. And I think the cool thing is that you can find your interest however you fit in. And that may not be an engineer. You might have a really strong interest in business, but want to be in the airplane industry and you can do that. So I, I think that that's the really cool part. You have managers, executives, you have finance, just so many different elements that are put together to build this aircraft. And then I hear a question coming in. Okay, so planes that are in use, they usually last for around 20 years. Um, most of the bigger airlines keep it for 10 years and then sell it to the smaller airlines at a discount and then buy the new ones um, just to keep up to date, have the best technology, fit the comfort. Um, but they can service safely 15 to 20 years if you're keeping up with your maintenance. And so I, the question is, how did you decide or why didn't you decide to become a pilot? I wouldn't say that I've made that final determination quite yet. I would love to be a pilot. I've flown um, probably four or five times. The, there's just a huge barrier into getting into becoming a, pi becoming a pilot financially. Um, there's a lot of flight hours, there's a lot of classes, and just, it's like around 10 to 15,000 trying to get my pilot's license. And so it's been a lot of, do I, buy a home or do I get my pilot's license? Do I go on vacation 
a couple times this year or do I get my pilot's license? And I continue to keep deferring it because I feel like I can always get my pilot's license. But I do think it would be a huge benefit to be in the aerospace industry, know how to fly a plane and be able to talk about it from a pilot standpoint. Um, are planes safe from lightning? That's a really good question. Uh, yes, they are. We actually have lightning attractors on on certain locations of the plane so that if it does get hit we know exactly where it's going to get hit and when you know what's going to happen and where it's going to happen you can already accommodate for it and so you'd be surprised airplanes get hit by lightning all the time but it's it, it doesn't affect the plane because we've already gone through this process to say safely okay what's something we're in the clouds what's something we should be aware of oh there's a lot of moisture and we don't want it to to rust so actually painting the plane is a huge way of protecting it there's two i want to say it's like two tons of paint on a commercial aircraft because it's just used as a protective layer and yeah so we do the same thing for lightning the windows should not break. No, <laughs> I, that is not, that's not usually something we're concerned of because of the materials that we use. Um, but an interesting fact about the windows is the shape of the window. You'll never see a square window because 20, 30, 40 years ago, there was an issue with the square window because when you're learning about in your science classes about forces and tension, so anything that comes to a point is going to have the most amount of stress. So everything's being drawn to this corner. When you're designing sharp things usually aren't great for stress. So it starts cracking near the near each one of those points. So you'll always see rounded windows. So next time you're in an airplane, look, look at the window and the shape. You won't see any sharp, sharp edges just because we don't want them to break. <laughs> Um, Cindy, you have a question here. Do they have self-flying planes? Yes, they do. There are actually a lot of self-flying planes. Actually, the commercial airplanes that you have right now could fly themselves, but for most people feel more comfortable with a pilot flying them. And so there's a lot of autopilot features and they fly quite well. There's also a lot of military uses usages for um, self-flying planes, whether you're talking on small scale or large scale. So yes, they can absolutely fly themselves. Let's see how much- The other question oh. is how safe it is to fly now during COVID-19. That is a very tough question. Um, I would say definitely follow the guidelines of the CDC. If you need to get on an airplane, make sure you have your face covering at all times stay clean, have the gloves, have the mask. And it's, it's really one of those, how safe are you being? How are you bringing your wet wipes to wipe everything down? I know that recently I had to get on a plane and I was wiping everything down. I had my gloves on, I had my mask on. I'm not sure I would just regularly be flying, but definitely using the precautions that have been outlined if you're going to. There are a couple of questions here about how much room you had on the plane. I'm not sure exactly what that question so, The interesting thing about how much room you're going to have on a plane really depends on the airlines. So I think a lot of people say, Boeing, why don't you give us more leg room? And the reality is they tell us how much leg room they want. And then we have different um, templates, if you will, to put on the floor to put the seating there. And so if they want more room, they would just tell us, but they like to have a higher capacity. So therefore they like the seats a little bit closer <laughs> because the more people on an airplane, the more money you're gonna make. So how much room do you have? You know, those private jets have tons and tons of room, but some of the smaller airlines or the cheaper airlines, uh, your knees might be up against the seat of the person behind you. <laughs> um, how long does it take to learn to fly? That's a good question too. Uh, it actually depends on the person and 
how quickly you want to get through the process. So I want to say it's 1500 flight hours. I don't quote me on that one. There's a certain, depending on the flight school that you're in, there's a certain amount of flight hours that you take and classes. There are people who get through it in three to four months and there are people that take a couple of years. It's kind of going at your own pace, how much time um, and how much finance you can dedicate, it, dedicate to it. Uh, Sydney, one of our Q&A questions is, what is it like to fly a plane? What does it feel like? Um, it's, it's really awesome. It's because you're, the view that you have while you're in the pilot seat is just incredible. And it really puts you into the perspective of, people are building these planes and I am really just in the sky flying safely, like breathing, no problem, because it is freezing up there. It is without all the insulation and protection, it is freezing and it can be dangerous, but I am safely just flying and seeing these phenomenal views. It's, it's really an incredible experience. I absolutely love and adore it. And you realize how much even with the pilot up there, the plane flies itself. It definitely was correcting me when I was doing stuff. So I was a little offended. Like, I think I know what I'm doing here. And the plane was like, no, you don't. It's fine. <laughs> Let's see. So we, the next one is why are lights dim during landing? So usually the, it dims during the nighttime hour flights. Um, and that's usually just to rest people, keep them calm. It's bright lights just alert your senses a lot more and dim lights just, just keep everyone calm. It, and sometimes for people, flying is very stressful if you've never been on a plane, not knowing what to experience, not knowing that we expect turbulence or that we've designed for certain things to happen. Um, unfortunately not everyone gets to to have time to talk to people who actually build the planes where we know that it it can actually fly with one engine. If one engine caught on fire, we can tear it out and still safely land. But if you don't know that, then there's like, it, there's a lot more panic. There's so many safety features built into these aircrafts that it's like secondary and tertiary. So you have okay, if this happens, then we'll do this. But if that happens, then we can do this. You can manually put down the landing gear if you can't get it to deploy. Like there's a lot of um, safety factors built in. So that's that's something that really, that really keeps us calm. But dimming the lights is another way to help other people who don't get to build the airplanes calm as well. Um, okay, Sydney, before we close out your section, I'd like you to share with the uh, students listening, what would they do if they were interested in aerospace as a career? What kind of words of wisdom would you have to share with them? Oh man, ask questions, be curious, um, explore, look into, look into the industry, see what's out there. There's so many different types of things that you can do with an aerospace degree, or even if you go into mechanical engineering or the, the technician portion of the actual physical building, what is it that you like? And really take the time to reach out to people and explore. I know it sucks to be virtual on everything sometimes, but on the other hand, everyone's virtual, so you can reach more people. So if you have questions, um, like find me on Instagram, ask me a question. I I usually respond. I may not be the fastest responder, but I promise I'll get back to you and just be curious. And I think that goes with pretty much anything in life. And don't feel like you have to have it all figured out today. I know you look at some people or I even look at a lot of people and say, oh, they have it together. But like, when you really think about it, when's the last time you've ever heard anyone say, man, I've got my life together. Likely not. And if they have, please send them my way so they can tell me their secrets. All Me and my friends, we're all like, oh, I got to get my life together. I don't know what I'm doing. But the reality is that's a part of the journey. So just explore. Don't be too hard on yourself and be okay to change and navigate. 
if there's anything 2020 has taught us is that whatever you thought you knew was going to happen can change. So embrace that and make it a part of your story. Thank you so much, Sydney. And I, I have one more question here, so I don't want to cut this person off. Their question was, and after this question, we're going to move to Andrew's group. Awesome. Uh, have you ever been in a dangerous situation flying? Well, flying. Um, I would say the scariest situation um, that I've been in was when I was, I studied abroad in Xiamen, China, and I was on the flight home, and there was extreme turbulence like I had never experienced. They were saying we were doing 500 feet drops while we were flying. And that was the first time I had ever felt panic on an airplane. I'm here, we were safe. The pilots were amazing. They did everything they could. And they stay in contact with people like the team that you're about to talk to to figure out the safest way to navigate home. So I think that was a perfect question to say, yes, safety first. And your pilots work really hard to do so. And the teams supporting them and surrounding them do so. And we're gonna hear from them now. So can't wait to see how uh, we all tie together. So thank you all. Thank you, Sydney, and what a perfect segue. So Andrew, take it away. All right, hello everyone. My name is Andrew Smith. I am the assistant professor of air traffic control at Hampton University. I also currently serve in the Air National Guard as an air traffic controller. Um, I was active duty for eight years and switched over to the guard. So I've been doing air traffic control for a little over nine years now, um, both radar and tower control. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, my background. And I have uh, four students here with me, uh, Sterling Jones, Julian Dillard, Daniel Austin and Deja Austin. Um, so I'll kind of let them introduce themselves once they uh, get to their to their slide. So uh, thank you, Sydney, uh, for those wonderful words. Um, it's definitely interesting. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, so that's always uh, cool. So we got to learn how planes are made. And now we're going to kind of talk about what I like to call the unsung heroes, the people behind the scenes that no one knows what we do which is air traffic control. So we are responsible for getting planes from point A to point B, all right? We're the guys that get to tell pilots what to do. And we have a little PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to share with you guys. One second. All right, so air traffic control, how planes get around. All right, so first, before we get into that, we have a, just a little bit of a background about our program at Hampton University, the Department of Aviation. Uh, we offer flight education, which is uh, for pilot training. We have air traffic control and we have aviation management. So here we have a few of our students um, flying or you know, working on, on the airport. Um, so we're a, small, uh, we're a small group. We only have about 40 students in a program or so. Um, so we're always looking for ways to, to grow. And uh, that one of those ways is by you know, talking to students as yourself, all right? Uh, one fun fact about um, Hampton is that I'm sure everyone has heard about the Tuskegee Airmen, um, you know, one of the best uh, squadrons in the in the military. I'm sure everyone knows about that. A lot of uh, some of the Tuskegee Airmen pilots actually came through Hampton University, along with five other HBCUs, including, you know, the most famous Tuskegee Institute. Um, but we actually played a, a role in producing Tuskegee Airmen. So that's something that I learned. Uh, when I took the job at Hampton University. All right, so what is air traffic control? First, let me tell you what we are not. We are not these guys, all right? 
whenever uh, someone asks, what is, what do you do? Oh, I'm air traffic controller. Are you the guys with the orange cones? No, that is not our job. Those are ground crew members. They're responsible for marshalling in the, the planes and make sure they're getting into their parking spots, which are, which is very important, but that's not what we do. So I just wanted to clarify that because I'm sure someone might ask that later on. All right. So air traffic control. So a little uh, bit of numbers here in the US, there are more than 45,000 flights a day with more than almost 3 million people that fly every day in the United States. All right. And so with so many planes uh, landing and taking off, you know, they're not flying in a sense by themselves. You know, we, that's where air traffic controllers step in. We, you know, guide the planes to where they need to go, ensuring they're separated. Uh, we're kind of like um, traffic lights, if you will. Um, you know, traffic lights tell you when to go, when to stop, when to yield. That's kind of what we do, but just in the air. Okay. All right, so some of the ways that we communicate with pilots, uh, we have headsets. Um, like, if, for example, I don't know if you guys can see my little headset here, but this is uh, the way that we communicate with uh, with the pilots. We give them instructions. We tell them when to turn, how to turn. We tell them to descend and uh, things of that nature. So that's what we use to communicate. Uh, on the screen, you also see what we have, the ETBS panel. So that's kind of like the a telephone. Um, so the frequencies kind of represent um, as a comparison, uh, telephone numbers. And so you'll dial up that frequency and that's how we communicate uh, with those pilots. Um, so again, pi uh, pilots get every transmission, every permission, they get that from us. All right, so we tell pilots what to do. So air traffic controllers, we kind of have a big head, if you will, because you know we think we're the best um, because of the responsibility that we have to ensure, you know, everyone is getting from point A to point B uh, safely. So pilots have to get permission from air traffic control before they can fly, okay? Um, and there's three different facilities um, within ATC that actively control uh, aircraft. So we have tower, we have the TRACON, which is your terminal radar center. And then we have the ARTC, which will be explained, which is the big center. Um, that will be explained on the next few slides, which is where I'll turn it over to uh, my students. Um, so the next slide that we have is tower. So greetings, everybody. My name is Julian Dillard. I am an air traffic control major, graduating senior at Hampton University. So one quick question I wanted to ask everybody is what part of the airport is the tower? So you can just type in the chat. What do you think? Whenever you think of airport, what do you might think might actually be the tower? I'm um, just going to take about a few seconds for that. So what do you think the tower might be? In the back, okay, okay. For a few, one or two. On the wrong, on the wrong way. Is the tower located offsite from the general airport? The roof. <laughs> okay. So, naturally, the tower is kind of what it sounds like. So, if we hit the next. There we go. So here we have a picture of Ronald Reagan Airport right next to DC. If you guys are in the area, and so the tower would be that big building right there, and that's where the air traffic control was sent in. So usually there's about three or four controllers in the building and they kind of tell the planes at the airport what, where and what to do. So we hit the next, some quick stats. So there are about 520 air traffic control towers in the United States. And so they are responsible for the takeoffs and landings of the different um, aircraft at these different airports. And so when you think about, you know, they're responsible for the takeoffs and landings, what do you think you'll normally hear from the tower themselves to the airplanes? It's a common phrase, you know, everybody probably hears once in a while to tell the airplanes to go. Clear, clear to take off. 
you are correct. If we hit the nice one clear for takeoff. So with that, think about air traffic or the tower as the starting position before they start handing off the planes to go where their final destination may be. Um, so with that, we're going to go to our move on to our next facility, which would be the Tracon. And I'll hand that over to my good friend. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sterling Jones. I am a graduating senior aviation management with a concentration in air traffic control from Dallas, Texas. And we are discussing the Terminal Radar Control Center. So who likes to play video games? Just type in the chat. Cool, cool. Right, so imagine sitting in a dark room and it's just you and a screen. It's usually how you play video games. You're looking at your TV. So you have the screen or your scope and it shows a compass, which is your airspace. And most importantly, it shows your airplanes. And you use your headset to give commands to pilots, such as their speed, their heading, and their altitude. So for example, you'll say American Airlines climb and maintain 13,000 flight heading 010 reduced speed 200 knots. And it just comes out your tongue just like that. So it's your job to keep the airplane separated so they won't crash in each other. So it's like playing a video game. However, you're dealing with real lives. So there are about 147 Tracons in the United States and you use your radar displays and radios to guide aircraft approaching and departing airports, generally within a 30 to 50 mile radius up to 10,000 feet. And you're in the center, you're between the tower and then the command center, which I'm about to hand off to Daniel. And you see here in the pictures, you have your radar screen. And then, yeah. So with that, center. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Austin. I'm a graduating senior, aviation management, air traffic control major from Hampton, Virginia. And I would like to explain the air traffic control centers. Um, the same rules apply to TRACON when you're talking about aircraft and how it can relate to a video game. But things to know about the center that differs from the TRACON is that there's currently 21 centers across the United States of America. And these centers are responsible for aircraft at the higher altitudes, meaning that these aircraft must be flying IFR instead of VFR. Um, since there's 21 centers that control aircraft flying through the US airspace, they have to work closely together to ensure a smooth transition of all aircraft through the entire region. And then I'll go ahead and pass it on to Deja put it all together, wrap it up. Hey, so my name is Deja. Um, I'm a recent grad of Hampton. I just graduated in December with a degree in air traffic control. So they just talked about, <laughs> thank you guys. They just talked about all those uh, centers and all those routes. And now we got to put them together. So think of air traffic control like a relay race. You run your race and then you hand it off to someone else and you keep handing it off till you guys complete the race. So basically, the airplane is going to fly. They first start at the airport at a tower. And then when they're flying, they'll get passed to a tracon. And then when they get like in the center, when they get like their highest altitude, when they're like 30,000 feet in the air, they'll be talking to the en route centers. And then as they're descending, they go back down to the TRACON and back down to um, the towers, which are uh, at the airport. So they all like pass on. So the tower people will say, hey, you have this aircraft coming into your airspace. Like you guys can see it on the radar. Um, you'll see the aircraft about to come into your space and then you'll speak to them and they'll tell you what's up with the aircraft and you'll hand off is the correct term. You'll hand off and then that's how you talk to each other. Um, and then I think we have a simulation. Or sorry, does anybody have any questions for us? There are quite a few questions here. So maybe if we can answer some of those before we jump into the simulation, would that be okay, Andrew? 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we got one. It seems to be a stressful job, is it? Yes. Um, so for the most part, it's going to depend on the facility you're at. Um, some facilities um, aren't as busy as others. Um, so that plays a big, uh, that plays a big factor in the stress levels. Um, but at your busier airports, it's definitely going to be a lot more stressful. Um, so you may have multiple positions within that facility. So for example, if you're working in a radar um, terminal, uh, you might have up to like 17 different positions and you have a controller for each of those positions and they're all responsible for a sector of airspace that they must control and, you know, hand off and get them landing and, and hand them over to tower. So it is uh, one of the higher, you know, stress jobs, but it's also really rewarding. So I, I love what I do. Okay. How many hours do, do air traffic controllers work at a time? Um, so typically we work in eight hour shifts, um, up to 10 hours at a time. Um, but we have, uh, rules in place where we can only work a certain amount of time. Um, so no more than 10 hours. Um, and then if you work, you know, six con consecutive days, you have to have 24 hours off after that. Um, so, but most facilities, you're probably going to be working eight hours. And again, because it's a um, high intensity job, uh, you might be working in position for an hour and a half and then someone will come in relieve you to kind of give you that break that you'll need. So you're not, typically you're not gonna be working in position for eight hours at a time just because it's, it's, it gets a little crazy. Okay, someone um, actually, I think you already keyed in the answer about salary. So in DC area, you you can average between 93 and 120 K, which is. Yeah. So numbers. it is a well-paying job. The, the mean across the board is um, 122,000. Wow. That is, that is your mean. So it, it is, it is well-paying. Wow. Uh, there was also the question, what is the normal distance between each plane when flying? And you answered that. Yeah. One. I started okay. to answer that. Um, a thousand, a thousand feet in three miles, but it also depends on how well you can see, um, what the rules are, if it's VFR or IFR. And when we say that, we mean, is it visual or instrument um, flight? So the larger airplanes, you use instruments to fly them. You aren't using just your eyes to fly them. And then the smaller ones, you don't really need the instruments because they're so small. Um, and then, yeah, just like if it's raining outside, if it's overcast, it depends on the weather too. Um, and also you can't have like a big Boeing 7, a 777 behind a little Cessna. You can't have it following very closely behind that because it would just like knock it out the way. So. And to piggyback on that. Um, so like Deja was saying, the standard separation is a thousand feet vertically and then three miles laterally. But then you have to factor in things like wake turbulence because you might have, like she said, you might have a heavy aircraft like a Boeing 777 and you might have a little Cessna following behind that. So again, the standard separation laterally is three miles, but for if a small is following behind a heavy aircraft, then that increases up to six miles. So those are things that you have to know on the spot when you're controlling aircraft. So you're sitting at a scope, you might have 10, 15 aircraft that is talking to you all at once. And some are larges, some are heavy, some are smalls. So you have to be able to apply those rules in real time and ensure that everyone is separated. Okay, what, another question. How is it possible to have near misses in the air? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so just, um, we're human. Um, I'll say that. Um, there is still an element of human error when it comes to air traffic control. Um, like I said, it's, it's a high stress job. You're talking to multiple aircraft at a time. Um, so there are instances where there may be a near miss or, you know, something crazy that's happening just because there, there's so much going on, right? And we do have the team, the team concept. Um, like I said, you're not really working by yourself. You have a team of controllers that are working beside you. You have a, 
a supervisor in the back, you know, watching over the entire operation. So there is that team element to ensure that those things don't happen, which are very rare for the most part. So um, overall, I think we do a pretty good job. Um, but sometimes, you know, aircraft or, or pilots are talking over each other. You know, you're, you're talking on one frequency and you're talking to one controller usually. So you're telling one aircraft to do something, they may interpret that differently. Um, so on both sides, there's that human error that can kind of cause things to be a little dicey. But, you know, a lot of aircraft have what we call TCAS, um, which is what, you know, if something were to happen, if a controller misses something, that TCAS will sound off and they'll be able to kind of separate um, from there. Uh, and there's a question here. Um, how many people fit on a Cessna? If they're just trying to sort of get scale from what you were saying. It's like four people. Um, but that's what they're counting for, the, uh, the extra fuel. So three, you don't have to account the, for the fuel before you do. And then just to scale, uh, like a 737 can have like 175 people, like a regular commercial plane. And a triple seven has 350 people. <sighs> okay, question from the, in the Q&A. What types of tests are required to obtain a job in this field? So um, there's a couple of different ways. Um, so um, we have the CTI school, which Hampton is. So it's a collegiate training initiative. Um, so it's essentially it's a partnership with the FAA. There's about 31 CTI schools um, with Hampton being one of them, the only HBCU. Um, so you can go through training uh, that way. You can go through a um, school route get your degree, which a lot of people do. Um, you get familiar with ATC, so uh, we run different labs. So for example, behind me, we have um, like, a, I'm at my drill right now, but this is an example of a uh, tower simulator. So you'll find that a lot of um, CTI schools, and then we have a radar simulator like you saw in the slide. Um, so that's one way. Um, and then they also right now have off the street hires. So if you have three years of full time work experience, um, you could apply as well. And so everyone will go through the FAA Academy and you will go through a series of tests, um, both written as well as hands on simulation. So you'll go through your training and then you will um, be put up for what you would call like a certification of some sort. And they will kind of monitor you and see how you do, making sure you don't have any airspace separation bus, you won't have any aircraft separation. Um, so it's a lot of work, um, but I think it's really rewarding. So I had one question here before you show us your uh, simulation. Taza, how many women do you find out there in this, in this field? Um, like none at all. <laughs> I think what is, I think pilots are like 2% or something in the industry, or is it like 4% and I think, or it's 2%, I was right, four. And then women or um, people of color are like 2%. So it's really not that women, uh, that, not that many women to begin with. And then um, especially women are just like, why are you even interested in that? They think it's like a guy's job to be a pilot or to be an air traffic controller. And I don't know, honestly, I just kind of grew up around it, um, just watching airplanes a lot, like watching air shows and stuff. So that's how I got interested in it. So yeah, it's not really that many women though. I think out of the 40 students that we have now, what is it, Andrew? Probably like less than 10 of us are females. Seven. Seven females out of the whole program. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> and Sydney, what's your experience been that way? Oh, definitely about the same. Um, the aerospace program is at University of Michigan has been around 100 years. And I think I was like still one of the first 10 of black females to graduate from the program. So it's, it's still um, something that we're continuing to work on. And I think that things like this and the representation that needs to be there, I, it, that's so important and instrumental in changing what the face of STEM is gonna look like in the future. So still hopeful, but we got a lot of work to do, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of women, uh, uh, female names on this call. So I hope 
that these are people who may be someday down the line interested in joining you. So Andrew, go ahead with your simulation, please. All right, so I'm going to show you guys an example of one of the simulations that we use. Let me get that up. Can you guys still hear me? We can hear you, yep. Okay. So this is an example of one of the sims that we use. So I'm going to demonstrate with, uh, I believe Deja volunteered to be the controller. Is that right? Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> St. Thomas Tower, value 788 requesting push and start. Value 787, St. Thomas Ground, pushback approved, expect runaway 28. Ground, 28 pushback approved. Value 788. So this is an example of a tower simulator. Um, so obviously you have the air, uh, the runways here. Uh, this is one of the smaller airports. Um, kind of wanted to show something that was pretty simple um, for the most part. Um, in most towers, you'll find a what's called a deep right, which is a radar display. So that kind of shows the the aircraft that are coming in. So you can kind of sequence and know uh, who's coming in and how to get ready for those. Speed it up just a little bit. Question, do you have to have all the phrases? St. Thomas Ground, correct? value 788, ready to taxi. Value 788, runway 28, taxi via Alpha Golf, hold short. St. Thomas runway. Tower, Denali 867 with you, runway 28. What was the question? Do you have to have all the phrasing exactly Continue correct? Continue taxi, value 788. So, uh, phraseology is a big part um, of ATC and is um, very important. Um, so you have to, we have what's called the 7010.65, and that is what we kind of consider the Bible of air traffic control. So that has all the phraseology, rule, and regulations. St. Thomas Tower, Magic 8541 requesting push and start. Ground, 28 pushback approved. Magic 8541. Right, so like I said, you're gonna have multiple aircraft talking to you. So I'm at, like I said, Deja is the controller. Um, so we got Denali 867 who just caught up while I was answering the question. St. Thomas Ground, Magic 8541 ready to taxi. Magic 8541, uh, runway 28 taxi via Alpha Golf, hold short runway 28. Continue taxi magic 8541. And then Denali 867 called you up wanting to land. 
Oh, Denali, um, 867 St. Thomas Tower, runway 2E, clear to land. Runway 28 cleared to land Denali 867. And value 788 is ready to depart. Value 788 St. Thomas Tower, runway 2E, clear for takeoff. Runway 28 cleared for takeoff, value 788. So while we got a little time, uh, did I answer that question? Um, is that the question that was asked about the phraseology? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to know if you have to say it exactly that way. Yes. Now there is a little leeway as far as, you know, trying to get the information out necessary, but for the most part we have phraseology. So it's almost kind of like learning a new language. And uh, a lot of trainees, myself included, when I was going through training, that was one of the hardest parts. You get so when you're running a sim, it's a lot easier because you know you're not talking to real people. But as soon as you get in front of that scope or and you're in that tower and you talk to your first plane, it's like you're just you're trying to learn to talk all over again. Uh, value value seven eight eight contact departure. About the Roger, good day. St. <laughs> Thomas Tower, Denali 1561 with you, runway 28. Denali 1561, St. Thomas Tower, runway 28, cleared to land. Uh, no, you don't have to talk monotone. I think that's just the way runway I talk. Runway 28, cleared to land, Denali 1561. <laughs> I'm just a monotone person, <laughs> but um, yeah, it just it's it's your personality. Some people are more engaged, others are more monotone, you know, straight to the point. So it's just however you talk is as long as you speak English. You know, English is the universal language for air traffic control. So all controllers in the world have to be able to speak English. And I'm and assuming pilots. the same as for pilots. Yeah. Yeah. So again, this is your D bright. So you can kind of see who's coming in. So we have Denali 867, Denali 1561 is behind him. These range rings are five miles apart. So you got five, 10, 15, 20. So right now I can see Denali 867 is five miles from landing and Denali 1561 is behind him. Um, this is a radar display for ground control. So like say you're at a big airport, you're not gonna be able to see necessarily all of the aircraft when you're looking at it, the tower. So you'll have your ground radar display here. So you can kind of see, for example, Magic 851 who's holding short of the runway. You can see his target and know exactly where he's located at. Um, here we have examples of flight strips. So these are the flight plans. Um, of the pilots that they have filed so we'll know exactly when they are expected to land, where they're coming from, we get their information as far as type of aircraft, and this is where we write down any information that is necessary. Um, so if there's an emergency, we'll write that on, this, uh, on the flight plan. Uh, if we give them a new altitude, we'll write that on the flight plan. So it kind of helps us keep track of all the instructions that we give to the aircraft. So do you ever have the people like a pilot disagreeing with you guys? Oh man, do we? <laughs> what kind of thing? How, how does that go? What happens there? Um, so pilots are required to listen to us. So well, sometimes they don't like it, but you know, we sometimes, sometimes they'll help us out. Um, they try to help us out, but like, Oh, we can do this. And it's like, no, we need you to do this. Um, so sometimes, there may be a little back and forth, um, but ultimately but it's our response. Would they, what kind of things would they disagree about? Um, procedures sometimes. So, for example, um, like if you look over here, you have the flight plan. So sometimes um, they're ready to go, but we don't have a flight plan on them. So we can't, you know, get them in the air. Uh, we can't depart them without the flight plan. 
And sometimes they'll be like, well, we need to go now. We need to go now. And at some point it's like our hands are tied, you know, until we get that flight plan, we can't, you know, depart. Uh, when I was out in Guam, we had uh, what was called a brown tree snake inspection. So every um, aircraft that was going to depart the island, they had to be inspected for brown tree snakes because those were very um, popular out there. And the, you cannot leave the island without it because you might cause an infestation. Um, so pilots, that was one of the big things that they did not like. Um, if they didn't have that inspection, they couldn't depart. So they would go back and forth with this about that. So it's a lot of little things, um, but for the most part, uh, we have a really good relationship with, uh, with pilots. And the question similarly was, what happens if they don't listen? Would they lose their license or get suspended or get their license suspended? Um, St. Thomas was, Tower, it depends Denali 1647 requesting push and start. Usually if it, and we're pretty much done with the, the sim, I just kind of wanted to show you guys a little bit of what we do. Um, like I said, this would be on like the big, um, this type of simulation would be on the big uh, screen like you kind of see behind me here. Um, but as far as the pilots are concerned, it just kind of depends on what they're ignoring. Um, usually if it's a safety of flight issue where it may cause a crash or, you know, something that's safe, like a hazard to safety, that's probably when you would get into loss of licenses and stuff like that. Same with controllers. We, we can lose our license to control. We'd have to go back into training, um, which you know, obviously would not be fun. Well, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I sort of would like to wrap up again with you, Andrew, and maybe some of your students as well, to say what you would say to kids who are out there. I think earlier one of our questions was if you have a five-year-old who's interested, but if you have any kids who are interested in becoming um Students of aviation, what would you, what, what words of wisdom do you have to share with them? Um, I'll say come to Hampton, put a plug in it for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave this question for, uh, for the students. Um, I have, like Julian, he's from Maryland himself. Um, Deja's from Maryland. So I'll kind of leave that question to them to kind of like how they got started you know, kind of what, you know, steps need to be taken in order to get into aviation. Deja, you're on. Uh oh, huh? um, what I would say, network, maybe. I don't know if I would say that to a five-year-old though, because maybe they don't know that, but maybe to like a five-year-old, just keep immersing yourself in it. So like, I remember when I was eight and I told my grandfather I wanted to do it, he was like, no, that's boring. And so I just never thought about it again until I got to college. But I wish I would have done it or just like, kept exposing myself to it when uh, through those years from eight to 20, um, yeah, eight to 20, because a whole, I would probably would have learned a whole lot more. Right now, I feel like I'm playing catch up in the industry of like trying to learn all these things and trying to get to these conferences and like, kind of learn what's the what and what do I want to do within aviation. But even if something that you're just kind of like sort of interested in, but you don't know um, that's what you really want to do, just having it in like playing in the background um, is good to know. So I say that, like, just keep going to air shows, like keep watching airplane movies. Um, maybe not too much because some of that stuff is fake. Um, just like keep playing video games and just stuff like that, um, I would say. And talk to pilots, don't be afraid. If you guys are in the airport, you ever go on vacation um, with your families, talk to the customer service agents, just ask them what they do. Um, they like to talk to kids, so feel free. Great, and Julian, we're ending with you. Um, for sure, and one thing I like to plug in is look for different aviation programs within your city. So I know here down in the Prince George's area, there's First Baptist Church with Lewin Arden. Um, they have an aviation ministry. And so from there, by like the age of 10, I got to fly like pilot seat in an actual airplane and you know, go around the whole area flying actually. They just give you the controls. So that's definitely one way to really immerse, immerse yourself in the um, aviation industry. Just look for different programs and try to get with it so you can actually do it firsthand. Great. 
So thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. It was very informative. You, asked some, we, you answered some great questions that our attendees asked. And good luck in what you do and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you for having us. Okay, bye-bye.